On July 1st, YouTube terminated Jordan Peer, J.P. Dillon's YouTube channel. His channel mainly focused on vintage hi-fi, vintage televisions, record players, tube radios. He hadn't posted any videos recently because he was in the process of moving, but he never posted anything that violated the YouTube community rules or terms of service or anything that would be identified in content ID, copyright, none of that. This account has been terminated due to multiple or severe violations of YouTube policy against spam, deceptive practice, and misleading content or terms of service. None of that. I'm positive this was an error or a computer glitch on YouTube's end that wiped out his channel. I went through this years ago and it turned out that it was a glitch that had something to do with the way your Google Plus was set up and linked to your YouTube. I don't remember the details, but I got my channel back and we need to try and get Jordan's channel back. 7,000 subscribers. Jordan is a true professional. Vintage Hi-Fi is what he does as a day job. He knows his stuff. He's always taken the time to try and help people out and post content of pattern problems on vintage tech and hi-fi and record players that would help people out that were trying to service their own units. And let this be a warning. If you have a YouTube channel, keep your day job because this happens. Channels get wiped out like this. And I'm hoping we can get Jordan his channel back because he had just completed his move and was about to start uploading content again. I know employees of Google and YouTube watch my videos and review them, so could you please take a look and see what happened to Jordan Peer and his channel? Also, if you're in the vintage tech community, this is a little bit of a call to action. Post this, share it, cut your own videos on it, the way we'll get his channel reinstated is if there's enough coverage and public outcry to actually motivate YouTube to take an in-depth look at what happened why his channel got terminated. For those of you that know Jordan, I would suggest that maybe you don't blow him up on a personal level with thoughts and prayers, but actually take a more proactive approach of posting videos posting in forums and getting it out there where maybe we can actually get Google to see it and like I said motivate them to take the time because YouTube is largely automated it's mostly all run by computers and servers and the algorithm we need to get it out there and actually get them to review what happened, get an individual human to intervene and take a look at what happened and straighten it out. Because he never did anything to deserve this. Never. He never put anything out there that crossed any kind of line or got anywhere near it. If you're interested in where I got these screenshots, if you'd like to do the same thing and use it, uh, Jordan Pure YouTube About and this is Bing. I know how everybody loves Bing, but Bing still has cached. So you can go here to cached and you'll see everything. And I actually found a playlist that Henry has here that has the names of all his videos. These are all his videos. All this time spent just erased. If you're not familiar with JP's videos, here's an analysis of an early Hitachi all solid state set he was going to upload when he discovered his channel was terminated. Hey YouTube, it's JP Dill. I know I haven't been posting in a while. I've had a lot to deal with. I've had to help get the business I work for classic audio repair situated in a new location. I've had to deal with a lot of side work and a lot of personal issues, health issues, but uh, this 
is one of many things that I'm just kind of pulling out of the ranks. Uh, I've got a lot of projects that I just kind of want to do short videos on, show and tells, things that I may get to in the future. Uh, this is about a 1968 or 69 Hitachi. I believe it's a CWU202. Um, yeah, in fact, the model number's right there. It's the CWU220. Sorry about that, 220. This is color, and this is one of Hitachi's first all transistor portables. You can see that it just very proudly denotes all transistor there. Uh, this I got from the original owner in Poway, but uh, unfortunately it does have the uh, instant on feature, so I'm going to guess that the tube is probably trash. I haven't really opened it up or tested it yet above, uh, above and beyond the basic stuff. But this thing is incredibly heavy and well built. This is a solid wood cabinet with wood veneer on it. It's got an ugly water stain to get rid of. It's got an earphone jack. It's got uh, slider controls on it, uh, which kind of makes me wonder if it's post-1970, but I've been told this is around the 68-69 year, and yes, I'm shooting it on the back of a car, uh, but that's a whole other matter. Let's get the back open and take a look at it. All right, so here it is, open up. You can see it's a very modular chassis. You've got all of your convergence adjustments and how to properly adjust them and in what order. There is a service switch there, uh, one which just cuts the video and one I think which also cuts the vertical. These are your drive controls here. These are your screen controls. And it's really nice here, everything, these are just plug-ins and everything can just come off and be serviced as a module. Uh, this has the Nippon Chemicon capacitors in it, which are far more reliable than their Elna Gray counterparts of the same era. It does use a Delta gun tube. And back there, there's your tuner and your IF. This is your color and video processing. There's your video output transistors there. I believe that's a power supply regulator or perhaps vertical output. I actually don't know. Uh, and then down in here, there's your main power supply board, which the camera doesn't want to focus, but it's down there where that plug-in is and this big dropping resistor. So fairly well-made set. I'll come over to the back here. CWU220, Hitachi Sales Corp of America, 4850 34th Street, Long Island, New York, made in Japan. They do give you the screen adjustments from the rear and the horizontal hold, but uh, everything else you need to adjust this set has to be done uh, with the back off. You need to know where all the stuff is. A lot of your service adjustments for color and size and the like are there. Uh, here, one of those I believe is the pincushion transformer and the other one is the horizontal driver transformer. Uh, your flyback is this guy here. I believe it's got an integral tripper, tripler. So I haven't done anything to this yet. Um, it's not even really been plugged in. So we need to test the CRT and find out if the CRT is worth messing with. And then uh, we'll fire it up and see if it produces any kind of raster. So let's get to it. Alright, so here's my CR7000. It's one of my uh, more preferred modern CRT testers. However, I can't find any number on this CRT. Uh, all I can find is a warning label back there which isn't really useful yeah and of course it's not going to want to focus on it uh, internal implosion protection blah 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 ok 
can't find anything under there. So the two adapters I have may or may not work based on what this is. So the heaters are always the same, but it's usually the grid arrangement and stuff that's different. Not really possible to see in there what visible condition the guns are in. Oh, and this plastic is crumbling too. That's nice. Okay. So let's try, first of all, adaptor number one. If I can do this one handed, if not, putting the camera down. And the camera's getting put down. All right. So let's stick this thing on here and see what happens. Filament came up. That's good. Let's dial that back a notch. 6.3 volts. And I don't know what the bias is on this tube. But usually about minus 68 volts is good for most rectangulars. So let's check and see if there are any shorts. And right away that shows red gun... Uh, is the only one active so that could very well mean that the this is not the right actually we'll just go to simultaneous all right so that looks good HK shorts are none cut off all right let's tweak the cut off well that's good we have cut off at least Green looks good. Eh, red's not doing too well. Gotta crank red all the way up to respond, but there's cutoff at least. So that's that's alright. See if we can balance these out. It's starting to come up a little bit more as it's been on a while, so that's a good thing. Uh Probably waking up. Let's check the emission. Serious? Wow. So, yeah, the red gun's the worst of the three. Cool. Wasn't expecting that. Good tracking, it says, too. Go back to a cutoff here, and you can see the cutoff's kind of gone down a little. Yeah, everything except the red gun is perfect. The red gun's a little tired, but who cares? That should produce a good picture. Excellent. All right, so I'll have to make a note somewhere that the uh, the number one adapter works. So I guess the next thing we got to do is power on and see what happens. All right, I am going to need to take the cheater cord off the back cover, the interlock cord here, because I don't have a cheater like this. I have a couple polarized ones laying around, but not like non-polarized. So we'll take that off the back cover and then uh, plug it in see where we're at all right so I've got my cord I'm gonna plug it in see what happens Ooh. there we go there the degaussing coil fire all right let's see if our instant on is instanting You can't see it in the camera really easy, but the filament is glowing, so it's definitely insta-bake. I would expect the CRT to be dead, so I'm actually kind of happy it's not. Let's uh, turn it on. Oh, I saw a vertical line there. Something on the screen. If we adjust the brightness, 
Yeah, we got something going on here. Not a whole lot. So, like uh, you see in Shango's videos, our uh, low power out of Mexico is channel 6. Which I guess ain't one to come in today. Or they got issues. Let's see our UHF here. This is a continuous UHF tuner, too. Something stuck, though. Yeah, I don't want to break it. Well, I guess the next thing we need to do is get a uh, signal generator hooked up to this. And see what it looks like. So far, so good. Alright, so I got my uh, 1950s. RCA WR64B. This is my uh, pattern generator that I restored many years ago and still is fairly faithful. Converted it to 75 ohm. So I just have a big chunk of coax coming out the back here. That's just going into the 300 ohm adapter on the back. And so if we go to standby for pattern, and we're on crosshatch. It's hard to see because of the outdoor light, but it's pretty good. Definitely have some convergence issues there. And then if we go to uh, dots, and then uh, color bars. No color bars. Oh, there they are. They're just really dim. That's black and white. And that's color. Now, it's one of these uh, crusty slide pots. There we go. Much better. And we lost it again. That pot is just terrible. Let me, uh, let's get some contact cleaner in that thing. Squirty birdie. Let's just work it here. It's getting better. We have a resolution now. That looks better. I think it's fourth bar it's supposed to be in magenta. Oh yeah, and I apologize for the blanking here, but that's just the uh, the outdoor. That's just how it's going to be. It's too bright; it blanks it. And let's see. The brightness really doesn't get all that bright on this. Let's see if there's like a sub-brightness control or maybe the screen controls aren't set up right. But without black and white, even with the brightness cranked up, you can barely see. I mean, I should be able to see something there. Or like if I go to a crosshatch it cranked up, it's not very bright. About midpoint, I should at least have visible black levels. Granted, the camera's some of that, but... Let's see, if we flick the uh, service switch back here... It makes things a little brighter. Maybe that's our bias switch. See if there's anything on here that's video peaking. 
drive controls there. But I don't see anything like a master screen control or anything. Let's move this over a little bit. Oh, well, there's something down there, but I think that's our size, vertical size controls. Yeah. It's vertical size and vertical linearity. Ah, there we go. It's your sub brightness control right there. So let's tweak Omatic here with the brightness at about maybe a midpoint. Oh, that's interesting. Check that out. I lost something. Interesting. Oh, that's that switch back there, that service switch. Okay. So in one position, it cuts the blue. In another position, it cuts both the green and blue. Interesting. Maybe that's to help converge it. Cool idea if it is. Alright, so let's set the brightness at midpoint. And let's tweak the sub-brightness control until we get a reasonable raster. It's starting to bloom a little. Let's back it off some. Alright. Yeah, that's about where I want it. About midpoint you start to see the black level come up. Okay. Let's go back to color. And the color's a little blurry. I don't know if that's a fine tuning problem or what. Not the greatest, but I don't actually have anything other than color bars on it right now. So. Oh, that's vertical hold. Trippy. But so far the colors are fairly faithful. Uh, let's go back here to this again. Let's see if there's a focus. Because it's kind of blurry. Focus, 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 focus. Vertical bias is that little guy over there. That's not going to do me any good. This might be one of those fixes, fixed things or it's got a uh, focus jumper. That's how a lot of these are. Nothing on the neck board. This, the Japanese love these low voltage focus systems. Um, yeah. So there's the connector that goes to the focus. Doesn't look like it's adjustable. There may be a jumper, like you solder that red lead over to the other side or move the leads over, because there's three total positions, but no pot, no adjustment. And then they've got this foam block here between the uh, flyback and the high voltage cage. So I guess that back there is the tripler, and then the flyback's inside there. So that may just be how it is. I could tweak with it, but don't really need to. All right, so the next thing I notice here is that the convergence, particularly up here, isn't all that good. Uh, if we zoom in a little, we can definitely see the error there with the green and the blue and the red. And I'm trying to figure out, I mean, actual grayscale looks pretty good. I mean, I don't see a tint there on the black level, so I think that's good. What we can do, we switch to dots. What we'll do is our static convergence first. And maybe that little switch will help us. So we can cut our blue, red and green, and then there's red. That's kind of cool, that's really handy actually. So, if I adjust the statics here, we can see the red move at an angle. And let's go over to the green here. Sorry to move the camera around, but maybe it's better with the uh, cross hatch. Yeah, I think it's a little better with the cross hatch. So 
So then that's good there in the center. And then let's switch the blue back on. And see if the blue needs tweaking. Like here's the blue lateral, which goes back and forth. I think the blue's pretty good looking there. Tweak the red just a hair. Looks pretty decent from here. And then we got this mess up in here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I like that. Alright, time to mess with it some more. I know, everyone's saying, why didn't you just leave it alone? It looked okay. Eh, not to me, it doesn't. I just have a much better time with dots. Okay, so the way that I do it is I BS it, and I try to put the dots side by side, and they move at a 120 degree movement here. I keep moving the camera, sorry guys. And I want to converge them on top of each other. It ain't easy to do as I'm moving stuff around, so I apologize for that. I'm going to try to get it as close to possible as I can. And keep in mind, I'm doing this one-handed. All while trying not to electrocute myself. Yeah, so far, it's just not getting too much better. There we go. It's starting to come in a little bit better in the center. And then switch the blue back on. And we're kind of where we were at before. So, about the only real thing that needs correcting now is just this top corner here. Which is a combination of red and green and blue. So, what we want to do is, is we want to focus on 12. And then 7. So these two right here. So we'll do this first and then we'll do this. We'll see if that makes any noticeable difference. And if we look up here, not really. I mean, it kind of changes a little bit, but not too much. And then it affects the uh, that blue there, which I'm not thrilled about. So now it's just this little patch up here. I might be able to correct this now too, which should be number four, and that helps a little but not much. So the convergence adjustments on this really don't do a whole lot, but I mean from a couple feet away it looks pretty nice. I do notice that the uh, the whites look a little pinkish to me. Just a little. And I think there is a green drive control back here. That's that guy. And so if we tweak on that just a hair. That makes it a little better. And then if we go back to color looks pretty good. The only unfortunate thing is is that I don't have my digital converter box here at where I'm at so I can't really give it a, uh, a full test. 
But shoot, dude, it looks pretty nice. I mean, geometry looks good. Ignore the bending up top. I know that's the generator's fault. But yeah, man. And then that volume control's a little touchy. But... Please, please be a Give me a but yeah, man, so far it's pretty sweet. So this is good. This is really good. It's got a good CRT. And for the most part, a decent picture as is. So, uh, since this is one of the ones I want to keep, probably what I'm going to end up doing is cleaning up this cabinet a little bit. I mean, that's down the road. Uh, fix the water stain. Uh, definitely make it look nice. And then we can go nuts with recapping it if we want to. But, I mean, there's not a lot of electrolytics in this. I mean, there's some in the vertical. But, like I said, these uh, Nippon Chemicons don't die often like the, uh, the gray Elnas of the time period do. These are pretty reliable. So, I may just leave it alone until something breaks. But, it's looking really good. And, I think in the future... I don't know if you can see it from here, but... Uh, yeah, they got this, uh, it's hard to see. Can't really get the camera in there to see it. But where the, on the back of the power switch, this is a dual pull, dual throw switch. And when you push it in, it engages the degaussing circuit and switches over to the little standby transformer that supplies about 4.5 volts to the CRT at all times. I need to disable that because uh, I don't want the instant on feature. It's going to kill this thing. But you'll notice when I turn it off, see the squiggly line there? That was the degaussing circuit kicking in. You can hear it buzz momentarily while it does that. And then when you turn it back on, obviously it's instant. So there it is. But it's a cool little set. I really like it. So uh, anyways, hope you guys enjoy this video. Uh, let me show you a couple more projects kind of like this that we're just going to yank out and kind of go through and test. All right, so this one here is a, about a 64 or 65 Zenith all-channel television. I don't know if you can see that there, all-channel television. That just means it had UHF. It's still got the projector window thing, which I think they did away with after 65. Uh, and then behind that is another Zenith. Let me get the light on here. It's another Zenith, but this is more of a, a bare bones. You can see that's all channel ready. And it's got a bunch of garbage behind the safety glass. That looks like crap. Back there is a 63 RCA black and white. Uh... Turkey jerky. It's a Trinitron KV1924R. There's also this uh, 90s Trinitron uh, that Sears color thing there. That back there is a test jig. This is the Chroma color. 17 inch chroma car I worked on a while back. It's got a failure in the vertical module. We'll get to that at some point. Under that blanket in there is a CTC 17. There's a 68 Magnavox console in there. There's also a CTC 25 or 27 there. There's a 66 Motorola color under there. And then uh, there's a CTC 16 back underneath that tarp, a 63 uh, Grand Theater Magnavox back there. All of this stuff is going to get uh, looked at. Yeah, beta machine, Sansui uh, speakers, all this stuff. It's just, I'm divesting myself of it. Uh, I'm never going to get to it. I've already got plenty of projects. As you can see, I've just got hordes of crap in this storage locker that just needs to go away. 
And so we're just going to start plucking stuff out and looking at it. And uh, those will be in future videos to come. Uh, so, yeah, more stuff, hopefully. Uh, keep your eye out and uh, see you on YouTube.